Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Russ Johnson. Uh, thanks, Ivan and Kyle, for putting this together. And uh, we're going to talk about some things with the market that have been brought up here about here. And uh, yeah, just feel free to mention whatever you want because I know you're going to end this. So that, that's good. That, that's why I'm glad we're here in person. I so you can actually get some feedback here. You're real with stuff. So, that's the, that's the way uh, so I was just going to also say, too, uh, I send out an email about once a month on kind of uh, market conditions with regards to livestock and that's villages and whatnot. If you want to be added to that list, uh, like um, this last issue had some things on uh, the change in hay stocks, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well too. So if you want to be, uh, add your email to that, I'll pass it around and, and you can get uh, signed up to that as well. Um, to just give kind of an update in terms of where we are in terms of just stocks, in terms of supply and demand, just basics here. Uh, you can see with like wheat, we have like 130 days estimated of use on can uh, stocks on hand for use of cotton down here around 250 days. So you can see uh, things have gotten tighter and that's partially what's been driving prices up, but we're, Nowhere near, I guess, as tight as like stocks were uh, back here in, in like 2011 and when prices were quite a bit higher. Although cotton were a little bit tighter in stocks right now than we were back then. But you can see, <clears throat> looking at just cotton here, uh, global cotton over time, uh, 2011 here, prices really, really jumped up there with the A index being above $2. Uh, but stocks are still quite a bit higher overall here for cotton than they were way back here in like the, <clears throat> the late 1990s and up into the early 2000s there. So what is the big reason why we have this jump up here in terms of our high stocks to use ratio where we have a lot of carryover in relation to what has been, been used? And you know, like in the teens here, particularly going forward, we have higher stocks there. What was the big change that drew caused that? Huh? China. China, exactly. China's, China's the 800 pound gorilla. And, uh, you know, they made the policy move to, they wanted to increase their stocks a lot so that they would not get caught short-handed not having any cotton. And that's, that's really what kind of almost drove up a lot because when the stocks prices were really high here, the supplies are scarce, they you know increase their stocks. And right now, you know, they have uh, probably about 45% of the world's stocks. They are the largest step producer and consumer as well, but they they do drive a lot of what's going on in terms of the the, the world and the stocks and the carryover. And it, you know, whatever they have over there is going to drive our markets to a, a certain extent. A few years ago. As I remember, the pump market was pretty high, and they bought a lot of product. I mean, bought some, some low quality product for a lot of money. And they got stuck here, even they didn't buy anything for a long time. And have they worked that? Have they worked that inventory out? Is that why things are moving a little bit uh, Well, yeah. I mean, part part of the problem too we had, you know, just a couple of years ago was the whole uh, tariff you know, dispute and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, right now, I mean, China hasn't bought nearly as much as they agreed to in terms of that, uh, you know, the tariff agreement with the Trump They don't care about that. They just buy what they need when they need. Yeah, but, but they, they are buying a lot more now in a lot of their deliveries. And that's one of the reasons I think we're seeing, you know, it's a fairly strong market as well, too. And some of it's probably even maybe driven, too, by the fact that they just can't get as much as they'd like in terms of, uh, with the container situation, you know, in the shipping situation. I'm actually on the because, you know, it used to be a two day turnaround from short for the ships. Now it's two weeks, you know, and plus, but this just shows the price here, you know, in the last a couple of years here for cotton. And you can see we've uh, made some nice, nice advances here, you know, going forward here. Uh, the red here is China, uh, but you know, it's not all in terms of the price. It has delivery costs here built into it. Uh, two spinning mills, a little different quality. Same with the A index here on the blue. 
it's it's one of the higher prices as well here too, but that also has some delivery costs into it. So it's not necessarily comparable exactly with you know the prices that are being quoted in India and China as well in the US. But uh, uh, no matter how you look at it, if you look at it in terms of the same uh, delivery point, you know, December 22, looking forward here, uh, you go back here to uh, last you know, March or a year ago, March 20 here, you can see we've gone up from about 55 cents all the way up to you know, pretty close to a dollar and 96 cents there. So, you know, it's been quite a uh, remarkable run here in terms of price uh, going upward here. And yeah, that's about right. Yeah, yeah, this is a couple of days before that. But yeah, so that just shows, I mean, uh, this is for the same delivery point, the same quality and everything. You know, it's almost gone up double, not quite. But how many times have you seen that before? Uh, well, the first time I saw it was in early seven. So I've seen this. I've seen it several times. Yeah, you've seen it several times. Yeah, so we've been here before, definitely. And uh, uh, we'll see, see where things go. Um, in terms of just what we're kind of looking at in terms of plantings, uh, this here gives uh, cotton planted acres over here, and this gives the ratio here of kind of the corn price relative to the cotton price. So if you look at the December corn features relative to the cotton features, as we move further over on this line, that means that corn is becoming more attractive relative to cotton. And you can see most of the time we're kind of in this band here as for this corn becomes, uh, you know, relatively more favorable relative to cotton over here, we plant less, less cotton typically. Um, for this year, and if we just look at the, the price ratio for like last Monday here, when I pulled this off, uh, you can see we're, we would be at a point where we'd say maybe we'd be planting a little bit less cotton than, than we have just in, in the, the last two or three years. But the estimates are actually for you know planting a little more cotton. And why is why is that? Huh? Price of what? It's the price of fertilizer. Yeah. <laughs> See, because like it has corn or even like the fertilizer. Yeah, yeah. Wheat. Yeah, because because the fertilizer costs are such that that some people are, are putting more probably maybe towards Cotton as opposed to close to like the water. Water cotton really shouldn't be that bad a deal here where our water is expensive here in places. On, on, on yeah, the but, and then we'll, we'll look at some of that here in a bit too, just, just as well. But overall, for the US here, in terms of the, the cotton grower survey that's out, and USDA will have their estimates out later as well, but expecting to be like about a 7% increase here in the US. Uh, the estimate here for uh, Arizona is to be off about 14.5%, largely due to, to water, as well as, as as what we have competing crop of the corn, right? Houses. Yeah, houses, yeah. And then, and then alfalfa is, 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 is strong, strong as well. Uh, expected to be up here with Texas up some, the southeast and the south, all the other regions. Uh, yeah, in the west being up overall, with some coming more from uh, Mexico and California. So how does that translate in terms of price levels? Uh, looking at what the USDA uh, just put out here in their January 12th report, uh, wheat prices are expected to be at about $7.50 per bushel there, up 41%, the most of, of any year, uh, year over year. Uh, you can see uh, cotton here, it's expected to be Forecasted that around that 90 cents per, per pound there. Uh, that's up about 35%. So um, all in all, uh, things are looking you know fairly, fairly strong here. And uh, I guess if we look at it in terms of the plantings, uh, this is just looking at principal crops and main crops because you consider you know, vegetables and tree nuts and whatnot. But you can see in the West here in particular. We have a lot of red here in the sense that uh, the change from, from the prior year here, uh, they're off uh, quite a bit here in terms of 21 from uh, 2020. 
So a lot of that was just due to the water conditions, I think, and, and drought here in general. And if we look here at Arizona, uh, you can see, so they have Arizona down with like a, you know, almost 600,000 acres there, up 3% in the principal crops from 20 to 21. And if we look, uh, that puts us about here around, around that 600,000. So that's not counting the vegetables up here or, you know, like the tree nuts and, and citrus um, crops. That we get to put us up around more like uh, pretty close to that. Uh, 900,000. Uh, but what do we see on this graph here? The biggest thing that probably jumps out is if you look at cotton here on the bottom, you go back here to the 70s, back in here, we had almost 600,000 acres of cotton there. And one of the biggest differences, if you go back to, to like 19, 1970, a dollar in 1970 back then would be equivalent to how many dollars today? And you can't tell us, Bruce. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm three to one. It's just about seven to one if you use the consumer price. I remember, in early 70s, you remember this too. We, so, we started with cotton at 33 cents and it ended up being <laughs> right. So, so I mean, the real price here, and then we'll get a little bit there, but yeah, it was quite a bit higher than, than it is now because basically, yeah, it takes about. Uh, you know, if you use the consumer price index, seven dollars a day to equal uh, well, one dollar was back in 1970. Uh, but the other thing is, we've grown a lot more here in Alfalfa, and uh, you know, if we look at just kind of a brief snapshot here in terms of our forage supply and demand, uh, Alfalfa uh, forage is about 42 percent of our crop acreage here in the state. Uh, we have quite a bit of silage forage. Uh, maintain the alfalfa. On the demand side, we have you know the dairy industry here. You know, probably takes you know maybe 35 to 40 percent of that. Uh, also, the other thing out there is there is an awful lot of horses out there in the state, and this number is hard to get an estimate on. But just all the compost that people, horse people, deliver to places would tell you that there's, there's a lot of horses out there, and they they need a lot of forage. Uh, cattle on beef. And then the other thing as well uh, are exports. Um, so if you look at the dairy industry, you can see it has just really you know, grown a lot in tandem with our population. And as our population grows, you know, we're now around 7 million here. Uh, a lot of these people have horses as well, too. You know, there's a certain percentage that seems like, oh, you want to have a horse. So I think that is, is fueling some of that. Uh, demand for the forage there as well on the horse side. And then we also have our exports here. If you look at exports in terms of how they've taken off, uh, this, this is US exports here, but you know, in the 90s, fairly flat there. And then we had China come on here in about 2008. And now China you know, accounts for almost about half of our forage uh, that we have out there. And this, the Western states here provide, you know, with the seven Western states are about 99% of all the exports, in, you know, the hay exports. So that's pretty important here. The West, we don't really export that much here from Arizona, but we benefit a lot from indirect effects in terms of what goes out in California because they, they ship, ship a lot more out. Um, the one thing we'd like to, why well, we've seen that big, you know, kind of shift from cotton to alfalfa is if we just look at the revenues here, just looking at Canal County, in terms of the yields and the prices uh, per acre here, and you can see cotton in the, in the 70s here used to be consistently above alfalfa here, on the red line above the green line. And then about in the 90s here, they kind of were equal here. And then lately here, it's been to where uh, you know, alfalfa has exceeded uh, cotton here. You know, that's one of the reasons we have a lot of that shift there. And what's been the driver in this shift? Is it then yields or prices? Because basically, this is just driven by yields, yields and prices. Do you have that comparison in there? Uh, in terms of the acres? Yeah, that's this graph back here. I guess is that what you're thinking? Or no? Yeah, I'm just looking at the two. Yeah, I mean, this, this is what we've had in cotton here. Over the state, you can see how it's gone down. This is how it's gone up. 
And most of this increase here has been in, in the central Arizona counties, central Arizona here, in the now and I think what most of us are looking at now is, is, is what we can net out of it. Yeah. What makes it quite everything drop so I don't know what the hell is going to happen. This year you can't find anything. It's expensive and anything that's got to do with oil or being transported to oil. I don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, I mean, if you look at these revenues here, I mean, price is what's been the biggest driver here in terms of increasing this uh, relative. Or the relative ratio here in terms of the alfalfa price, the alfalfa price. Here. I think for a lot of people, the alfalfa might have to be two hundred dollars to be to be very profitable. Yeah, no, I, 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 to have to be dollar and four. Oh, exactly. What are the beef prices? What are the beef prices? Uh, they're over two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on it depends on where you're at. Yeah, but, but yeah, there's. There's there's some some but the spot right now also is higher than, than the future, so you know, just just for up with where do you get this thing prices? Yeah, and I, I mean you know will they will they go up they go up people there if we have the water if you have the water the same thing here. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, I mean, this, if we look at the yields, you can see they've done, been relatively almost the same in the sense that the yields have gone up about the same for alfalfa as cotton. A little bit more for alfalfa than cotton, but not, not a whole lot more. Um, so when we look at the hay situation in terms of the outlook, we can see that stocks here are really quite low relatively to where they have been historically. And also, if we look at the percentage change in hay stocks, is, this last year from December 2020 to December 21. You can see here all the states here in the West here are all all in the red. And even like Arizona, we're off you know 40 percent from what we have. And you think of hay, I mean, like you're talking about fuel prices. I mean, hay is a commodity where it's 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 relatively bulky to ship, you know, compared to like like grains. That's why we don't see you know the same. We see a lot of uh, Kind of regional markets with hay because it becomes difficult to ship, you know, across the country as opposed to like grain that can move uh, to where we have almost a you know similar price all the way across the state. But see all the west here, in particular up in the northern here, uh, way off on the on the, the hay stocks, and that's you know fueling a lot of our our, our price there as well. That partly and, attributed to the drought. Yeah, so that relates right to the production here and see the states that were all off in terms of production here. They, they almost mirror exactly the states here where the hay stocks are low. I mean, we had low production that translated to the low stocks in there. Uh, the one outlier here in the West is Nevada. Uh, they, had, they had a lot of increase here in their, their production here and, and increase in their stocks as well. Uh, you see, Arizona, we were, you know, but fairly fairly flat there uh, overall, but uh, the stocks number is it's very low, even though we were uh, you know, up a little bit here in production. And our production, what's also interesting too, you know, we think of Arizona being relatively small compared to like California. And you know, California has more acres of you know almonds and grapes and all these crops, and we do it now. Yeah, water. Yeah. But but we have a, you know about forty percent of the acreage or, or production anyway I guess it's to say as what California does in terms of alfalfa you know and you think of you know Arizona being a relatively scarce water state California as well too but what we have uh, you know this is our largest crop by acreage you know by far as we showed earlier in terms of our portfolio. You know, well, 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 yeah, you probably are. <laughs> There's what what all uh, I mean we have a little bit of uh, non alfalfa in the state but for the most part we're pretty much you know alfalfa for the most part we have like maybe about forty thousand and then there's about you know that fifty five thousand acres or so forage that's estimated to go up for some some as well too so corn silage. 
Uh, the other thing, though, in terms of why I think it's it's really interesting, the hay, the outlook for hay prices is just when you look at the new seedings out there. Uh, overall, for the whole country, you can see there's an awful lot of red in terms of just being less than we than we were, you know, in general. So, you know, when you think of more kind of the, the longer term outlook, you know, for the next couple of years anyway, uh, there's not any other really area where the hay is going to come from, you know, because you take, you know, the northern plains here in the west, I mean, the new seedings are off. So, I mean, it's going to be several years, I think, you know, before there's any substantial increase in terms of hay production from any of those hay. So, I mean, the adage is, you know, what, high prices cure high prices, right? You know, supposedly. But I don't know where the hay is going to come from to necessarily, you know, cure for if there, if there is high prices. I think a lot of it is like Bruce says, you got to get, you know, over $200 a ton just to, just to make it in terms of. But $200 a ton several years ago was more just a real cost of the deal. But now, yeah. The, the we, we've been selling some hay for almost three hundred dollars, but I don't know how long that's going to last. Yeah, and now that's USDA hasn't moved their prices up that much. You know, even though I know there's a lot of sales above that. But one of the things I think I just want to this talk was, this was local and strong. mention here is just about the, the preventive planning here, especially with regards to drought. Um, Preventive planning has been around and it's been used in the state. And when you think of you know our water allocations being reduced and everything, I guess we just have to make sure I guess everyone's aware uh, and maybe even taking advantage of what are some of the crop insurance possibilities with regards to preventive planning. Uh, a couple of things to note when your water allocations have been reduced, preventive planning can kick in. Uh, in terms of what is a traditional water source. Uh, you know, if, if you've been using this source three out of the last four years, and definitely if it's been reduced, uh, you know, if it's two out of the six, then probably not. And the other thing is, if you have wells, uh, you're not required to start up your wells unless you're no more than what you've kind of historically been used. Um, so this just shows an example here. Uh, 100,000 acre feet would be kind of like what would be the normal. An example would be that they be able to irrigate in this case, uh, this food producer should be able to irrigate, you know, 100 percent or 100 acres. But what happened here? This is saying that the, the reservoir is low, kind of where we're at now, right? In terms of the reservoirs are low. Okay, but then what normal weather would provide here up to this level would ensure for up to this this amount here, even though you know. Maybe historically you would want to be up here in terms of 100. You know? So you can't you can't buy insurance to get you up to like say you know there's 100 you know, of the water allocation when the reservoir is lower. But you can buy insurance for what the normal weather would bring you up to in terms of coming out for this year. So like this is looking at it. Say there's 10,000 acre feet here in in 2003 or in this case 2000. 21 and then for 2022, normal, you know, moisture would bring the reservoir up to a certain level for how, how much water that you could actually uh, irrigate with. And there's a the publication here, this link, and uh, you know, has hundreds of pages you can go through. But the idea is you can buy, you know, some coverage and this preventive planning is something that's been used in Arizona for quite a few years, especially in the uh, Al County. Texas for a long time. Well, I own, I own a crop insurance company. I don't know if you knew that or not. Yeah, no. Well, it's it's true that, that there's a lot in, in Texas, definitely. Well, you really know how to use that down there. Yeah. yeah, and there's if you look at it in terms of, uh, I should have put that chart in just for your use, but uh, on another paper I've got. Where if you look at it in terms of the amount of subsidy per pound, you know, Texas is like tenfold what it is in California. You know, as, as you know, but uh, we do receive, or in the state, we have received a fair bit of um, indemnity claims uh, through cotton uh, with regards to preventive planning. Um, this just shows a little bit here in terms of the last uh, 
five years data available. In terms of this is the payout for each uh, dollar the producers put in in terms of all time. So it's been anywhere from like a dollar forty six up to like you know seven dollars. Uh, Cotton, because their acres insured as a percent of all crop acres here, we account for about you know 30 to 40 percent of all the cotton acres that are out there. Probably 95 percent have crop insurance on them around there, pretty much. Uh, cotton though receives about you know 60 to 80 percent of all the all the indemnities that go to uh, Arizona crops. This is taking out the the that the goes to the rainfall that makes for pasture and inside forage. Uh, but failed irrigation supply here, which relates to basically that reservoir, uh, that accounts for you know about 80% or, or 40 to 80% here. And in the state and the counties that mainly have claimed that are canal largely on. Um, San Carlos, as well as as well as uh, Graham County's jumped in there quite a bit now too. They're also on that the, the Gila River there, but there has been some claims here in Maricopa County as well. There will be some more than here next year. Yeah, and there's probably even more. But, but, but there but there have been some already, and you can see in terms of Pinal County has been the largest puller of this in the past, claiming about you know ninety percent of that goes to the field irrigation supply. And of the failed irrigation supplier equipment uh, for Pinal County cotton, it's amounted to about you know 30 to 60 percent of all the indemnity claims for all crops in the state. So there has been a lot of payouts in Arizona that have gone to this you know, preventive planning. San Carlos. That's that, that's, that's where, where this most is. of it was. That's yeah. where this is. Yeah. This canal is the San Carlos Reservoir. I didn't know if you knew that I did. You, did you know that? What's that? Did I, did I, did I have a country that's for sale for I didn't know. I didn't know that until today. Well, that's good. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's a good, good thing for you to be interested in. Since 2007. Yeah. Um, but I guess the other thing to know, too, is just alfalfa has never had a claim in regards to that. <laughs> Any, any crop insurance in, in Arizona uh, being irrigated and everything and having so many cuttings. Uh, but there is whole protection <coughs> protection that could be something that that may uh, work in terms of you know protecting on, on the revenue side. Uh, one thing about farm <coughs> revenue protection is it, it has the highest subsidy rates of, of all the policies out there. Even of the, you know, the actual production history or anything. Uh, if you have a three commodity account, you can go up to 85% of your revenue to insure up to. But most of these subsidies here are like, like 80%, which there, is. There's going to be a lot of a lot of indemnity paid on this cotton crop this year, both both with lost yield and, and, and the price situation. And the price, yeah. Um, but, you know. The, even, though, even though the price is better if you buy revenue protection. If yeah, they're going to be paid at a dollar nine cents on the loss. Yeah, no, that's true. In terms of, and I think that there's going to be a lot of people take out uh, price or revenue reduction on the, on their cotton cut this coming year. But on the forage side for the alfalfa, uh, you know, we don't have a revenue product. Yeah, you know, other, you, other than this this whole farm revenue. That's you have why an APH, you have an APH, but you don't have a revenue right. protection. Unless you do the whole farm revenue protection, which is something that I think could probably work out in the sense that you know you have a, it's essentially your kind of your average of your your historical five year uh, average on your schedule. It's usually yeah. better to take that off, take that out after you've had some good years rather than that. <laughs> no, that's true, and, and, and hopefully you know people are coming off a fairly good year anyway. You know. Uh, of revenue on their alfalfa side and other crops, you know, they could all go in there. But uh, you know, the whole farm revenue protection is something that could, could give you coverage, I guess, for you know a drought here and and water being cut cut back. Uh, the other thing too is if you have other policies included with your cotton and whatnot, that lowers your premium as well. There is though a maximum in terms of the liability amount of like uh, eight point five million. Um, so 
you know, that, that's just something to consider. But I think <coughs> looking forward, you know, preventive planning is something that I think when you look at our reservoir status and the water situation in the state, you know, I think it's something everyone should, should definitely be looking into. And then even on the dairy side here, I think, you know, the dairy margin <coughs> coverage is something historically it hasn't been a lot of sign up in the, in the state in part because of, you know, it tends to have higher higher rates of subsidy for the first amount than, than a lot more amount of, of coverage. So, you know, they say, well, it won't cover all of their production, but at the same time, uh, you know, with the forage prices going up, you know, the margin there, it's possible they can have some protection there uh, going forward, uh, especially if, if we don't have uh, a lot of reduction in some of the acreage that we have here in our forage. Uh, and the whole farm revenue protection, I think, it, you know, it hasn't been around forever, but it's been around for about, you know, five or six years, but we just have, haven't had a lot of sign up at all. It, it's more complicated and you have to show yeah, no, it and is. things like that. Some people, don't like, some people don't like to yeah. show those things. No, exactly. I think you know, and have a lot of people don't like to show this, but it's something to consider, I guess. And you almost have to kind of farm the program as much as you have to farm the soil um, to take it take advantage of these to stay in business in some sense, because as you probably know, Bruce, I mean, uh, when the loads hit, if you have something that you kind of cover with losses. Yeah, there, that, people are going to have to start taking a look at, at, at some of this stuff with this inflation like this yeah. and, and, protect, and, and protect themselves. I think that's going to happen. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's like what the very margin coverage is built around in terms of the, the margin between what you're getting and what you're paying. 